This will give you a glimpse into the world of Jeff as I know it. And I've got a track queued up uh, to start this up show, so hopefully you enjoy.
that was uh, and a little bit of an oldie by now. Uh, that was Porn on Beta's Everything's Cool. Uh, I can't remember off the top of my head which album that was from. I think it may have been from their first one, uh, Welcome to Real Life, uh, which is a good album. I just don't remember if this one is one of the songs on it or not. Uh, Porn on Beta is, uh, I think, now defunct. It was a rant radio project uh, from Sumerian, uh, being the lead singer there. Uh, I think everything they do is also in the Creative Commons as well. Uh, that one specifically I have marked as Creative Commons non-commercial uh, by uh, Share Like 3.0. Uh, so there's that. Um, and so that is just one song of their their kind of backlog. Uh, all of it I think is available for download online. There may be one or two tracks that aren't. I'm not sure, but uh, either way, uh, I will try to include a link to that. Uh, when this video is kind of in its finished form. Um, so please do go check it out and download everything that Porn on Beta has ever done. Uh, I don't know if you can still buy their CD. It used to be available for purchase, but that was starting to be quite a while ago. Um, it is worth the money. But uh, so as I kind of pointed out at the beginning, uh, this is a weekly broadcast uh, and hopefully uh, there is going to be some feedback in this particular episode because uh, this is going to be an episode where I am not necessarily the most knowledgeable about some of these topics, uh, but I know some of the people who could be listening uh, are a lot more closer connected to it. Uh, so uh, the goal of this is to be a back and forth. So uh, if you have information that is useful to these topics, don't be afraid to either comment in the threads or send me a message uh, via something like Ricochet uh, or any other means that I am available, uh, but carrying on. So the first thing I kind of want to get into today uh, is something that happened this week, uh, or at least in the past week or so, and I've got a link here from one Zestrion at Mastodon at, or dot social. Uh, quote, MySpace lost all of the music its users uploaded between 2003 and 2015. 2003, I think, just being the beginning of MySpace, and then 2015 being about three, uh, just over three years ago. And so the the link that they link to is a Boing Boing link, uh, which kind of goes into uh, the fact that they thought uh, they had some kind of technical problem, and they said that they were working on it, uh, but now they're admitting that all of their files are lost. Quote, as a result of a server migration project, any photos, videos, audio files you uploaded more than three years ago may be no longer available for on or from MySpace. We apologize for the inconvenience and suggest that you retain your backup copies. If you would like more information, please contact blah, blah, blah. Uh, quote, yeah, apparently they didn't have a backup. Someday this will happen to Facebook, Instagram, Tumblr, etc. Don't trust the platforms to archive your data. The Internet Archive will host anything freely distributable for free forever, and they have the mirrors of their servers in California, Egypt, and Amsterdam. They're a mission-driven nonprofit supported by philanthropists, foundations, and small money donation. I'm an annual donor, quote unquote. That's from JWZ, or Zed, uh, who is one of the people who helped to develop Firefox and Mozilla and Netscape, I think, even back then. Uh, he's kind of a cool guy. Uh, but I would even add to that uh, in that you too can help uh, support the Internet Archive. They do accept Bitcoin donations from anyone uh, with Bitcoin to send at them. Uh, but also it is worth considering that one day, despite our best efforts, the Internet Archive will go away. It is eventually going to decompose and all of its data will be lost. And so if you have the copy of the important thing you don't want lost when the Internet Archive eventually dies, uh, well, then it'll survive. If you don't have that copy of whatever it is you want to survive after the Internet Archive, then that, you know, that data is gone. And that is, you know, the Internet Archive may be better than Facebook, Google, uh, Flickr, Tumblr, whatever the, the current quote unquote cloud storage uh, uh, thing that everyone uses. Uh, maybe it isn't, maybe it will be, but uh, in either case, both of those things could go, and it's worth keeping that in mind. Uh, but it's also worth kind of thinking about what exactly does it mean that MySpace music is just gone now, pre-2015, uh, 
uh, you know, 2015. From the perspective of, you know, why would anyone use MySpace? Uh, there's the, the question of, well, why did people use MySpace? And a lot of it was because it was a way to find out about new music and a way for people to find out what their friends listen to uh, and then go find that music and listen to it or buy it or, you know, download it or whatever it was. Now, granted, I never used MySpace. MySpace came out just after, uh, you know, 2005. I was going to university using dial-up. It was, you know, kind of a, a little bit of a mess in terms of my ability to use the site. So it wasn't all that useful to me, but I know so many people who used it and so many bands, so many artists, so many musicians who went out, put their music up on MySpace or at least put a band page up on MySpace and, you know, pictures. I don't know if they had video, but uh, certainly there was a whole, you know, decade worth of culture and music and just the, the especially the independent music the, the the small artists the the artists who you've never heard of but who you may very well find to be the best musician you've ever heard the best music you've ever heard or the thing that speaks to you personally that could very well have been on myspace and it's just waiting for you to find it or at least it was up until this week when they accidentally lost it all this is a, a huge tragedy this 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 loss is just uh, it's it's enormous the a decade worth of independent independent musicians and small musicians work could just disappear and you know so much of it hasn't been backed up because this is just something that people just took for granted that it wouldn't uh go away and yes, people downloaded mp3s onto their computers, but there's been a trend in the past couple of years for people to use services like Spotify and even YouTube and Facebook uh, as a way, maybe not Facebook, but certainly YouTube is a way of listening to music by default. And that has encouraged people not to download a particular you know, song onto their device, uh, in part because the RAA and the uh, particular labels have a scorched earth policy uh, that has been going on for you know decades now, uh, encouraging uh, people not to have music, not to own any of the music. Even if you buy it, even if you give money to a musician, you are encouraged to not have that copy of that music and instead just have a, a permission to use it, a, a right to, uh, to use it uh, that's condi or conditional or contingent upon the permission of the established uh, you know, is institutions that control culture. And so this is uh, the consequence of that model. The consequence is that a technical mistake, a, a slip up of who knows how, how important of a person made this slip up. You know, I haven't heard of anyone getting fired over this or uh, th there's like a data officer or something like that, that the buck stopped at him or whatever. But at the end of the day, this is a technical mistake. This is, I'm sure MySpace didn't intend to lose a decade worth of culture. Uh, I'm sure they didn't intend uh, to, to burn all these CDs in practice that may never be heard again. Uh, but it still happened. And so when we look at the, the, the policies that the RIAA have pushed over the past 20 years uh, and think, well, what are the consequences? What could the consequences be? This is one of the consequences. Decade of music lost a whole generation of people who grew up listening to music that was found on MySpace that when they get to their old age are now not going to be able to listen to the music that was so meaningful to them in their youth. Uh, and yes, there was probably older people who listened to MySpace too, but don't, you know, this, this miss, this gap, this void that's now created is, this is, this is worth pointing out because, you know, th this loss, it didn't have to happen, and it, the next one doesn't have to happen. When YouTube goes, there's so many records out there that I have found on YouTube that people have, you know, recorded the, the, the copy of the record, thrown it up on YouTube so the world can listen to it. And now you can listen to, you know, things like old Soviet Union music from, you know, just after the revolution. There's music from the... Uh, the, the, the public domain recorded and, and thrown up on YouTube. There's, you know, millions of independent artists, uh, some of which I've been, you know, had the pleasure of meeting that have put their stuff on YouTube. I myself have put myself up on YouTube. But one day YouTube is going to do the same thing. Google Plus right now 
Uh, Google has a history of, of, of taking the hatchet to its uh, projects, and Google Plus is just the most recent. Eventually, that hatchet will fall on YouTube, and all of that music, if it is not backed up, will be lost. And like I said, you can back stuff up locally. You can back stuff up to the Internet Archive if the copyright law allows you to do either of those two things. And again, this goes back to why is it important that we have copies of music, or, or at least music in our lives that allow us to copy, that allow us to make backups of, that allow us to send to the Internet Archive, that allow us to preserve so that when that technical mistake happens, when that, that, that hard drive dies, when that company goes out of business and is bought by some kind of venture capital firm that forces it to make you know, cuts to its IT department that then eventually causes that data to be lost, that that song, that music, that, that key to understanding who you are is not lost permanently, as in the case of so many songs, so many, many files on MySpace this week. So that was MySpace. Uh, what else was going on in the world? Uh, well, uh, one of the things, and this is something that a whole bunch of sites actually covered, uh, is there was a change in the law in Russia uh, about their, um, oh, hold on, why is this not working? Uh, that is basically along the same lines as some of the laws that have been proposed here in Canada and in the States uh, and elsewhere uh, about fake news and regulating uh, the ability of people to report on news uh, supposedly to prevent fake news. So let's go into some of the people who have covered this. Cyberpunk is, uh, has a link to, quote, Vladimir Putin signed sweeping internet censorship bills on Ars Technica. Uh, we've got uh, Infowars uh, cites EU censor, or Russia cites EU censorship regime to justify passing, quote, fake news, quote, internet insults bills. Um, we've got uh, the Liberty Means, quote, or Liberty Means, quote, Mo Freedom, uh, linking to Putin's, or Russia's Putin signs law banning fake news insulting of state online. So this is not something that is just like one site is reporting on. This is not something that, you know, someone has made up across, you know, a good couple of different places. Uh, they're reporting on this. So let, let's go into how Tector describes it here. Quote, Russia's efforts to clamp down on every, anything resembling free speech on the internet continues unabated. Putin's government has spent the last few years effectively making VPNs and private messenger apps illegal, which, by the way, probably includes Tor. Uh, going back, uh, while the government publicly insists the moves are necessary to protect national security, doesn't that sound familiar, uh, the actual motivators are the same old boring ones we've seen here in the States and elsewhere in the world for decades, fear and control. Russia doesn't want people privately organizing, discussing, or challenging the government's increasingly authoritarian global impulses. After taking aim at the VPNs, Putin signed two bills this week that dramatically hamper speech, especially online. One law specifically takes aim at the nebulous concept of fake news, specifically publishing any online material that exhibits blatant disrespect for society, government, official government symbols, constitution, or governmental bodies of Russia. In other words, Russia wants to ban criticism of Putin and his corrupt government, with experts telling the Washington Post that the updated law effectively removes the pesky legal system from what was already a fairly draconian system. Quote, prosecutors can direct their complaints about online media to the state, which can block access to websites if the offending material isn't shut down. Again, doesn't that sound familiar? Doesn't that sound very much like the EU's Article 11 and Article 13? Doesn't that sound very much like Canada's uh, laws uh, that are being discussed with the, you know, uh, hashtag uh, don't censor uh, that Unifor and Bell are pushing here in Canada? Interesting that this is happening not just in Russia, but the EU, the United States, Canada, uh, China's uh, clearly ahead of all, all of us in this regard. Uh, I, if I remember correctly, India even uh, was pushing for something like this a while ago. I don't know how far they got. And the UK uh, is definitely pushing for something like this. So, so this isn't like a local you know, thing to Russia. The, the, these bills are not something that uh, the, is exclusive to the you know, faraway country. It doesn't matter here whatsoever. It doesn't matter 
you know, they'll eventually get rid of it. It's, it's just a short-term thing while Putin's in office. No, this is, this is a, a, a trend, a global trend. And so continuing on here, quote, uh, websites that now spread, quote, fake news, unquote, in Russia, defined as anything that criticizes Putin and his co coalition of mobster oligarchs, now suddenly face fines up to 1.5 million rubles, uh, which is a significant amount in Russia. Um, $22,000 US. For repeat offenses, another companion law signed by Putin this week is equally problematic. It will update existing laws to make it a federal offense to insult the Russian government or its political leaders. Repeat violators of that law can face fines up to 300,000 rubles, 4,700 US, and 15 days in jail. Uh, da, da, da. There's more of this here. Uh, quote, Russia, to, this is from Medusa.io. Russia today staff face 5 million ruble penalties if they criticize the network on social media. So this is even affecting Russia today. Russia today is basically Russian propaganda. You can count on them to, to give the Russian, or at least the establishment Russian, perspective on global events, much like you can count on the CBC here in Canada to give the establishment uh, version of events in Canada, uh, probably some something between Fox News and CNN in the States, uh, the BBC in the UK, etc. This is like the idea that they have to even be worried about RT is ridiculous. Like, what are they worried about? The RT is already not going to cause them any problems. The, they're they're so tightly under control. It's 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 kind of funny to watch. Um, but even so, like this is the extent that this law is going. That even Russia today isn't exempt or isn't is in kind of like the the sights of. Uh, you know, pushing uh, what is reasonable to, to cover or talk about online. Uh, what else have we got here? Uh, so Infowars, um, which by the way, Infowars covered this. If your media is not covering this and Infowars is, that's a problem because Infowars is like pretty close to the bottom of the barrel. Uh, you know, when people ban it, there is some reason why, you know, I, I personally don't think Infowars should be banned, but I understand why people call for it to be banned. And so is this front page of the CBC or is this like, I, I haven't checked today uh, or this week, but it's it would be interesting to see, you know, how high up in the priority list this is, because this is a big deal. This is, how many people are in Russia? Like over a hundred million? Uh, it's, it's something comparable to the States, right? So this is millions and millions of people who are suddenly going to be targeted by this fake anti-fake news law that's going to prevent people from forming, discussing alternative narratives to the official narrative that the government has. This is right, right up there with 1984 in terms of the government says something happened, and if you say that it didn't happen, that's fake or, or conspiracy or whatever. And suddenly you can go to jail if you're a repeat offender for it. Like it's it's so far out in terms of restrictiveness. Uh, and yet uh, we are pushing for the same things here. So the first step to stopping this is going to be not passing it here to stopping Bell and Unifor when they try to pass these sorts of things here uh, and to organize with whatever freedom we have left to stop it so that when Putin says, oh, hey, you know, I'm only doing it because the EU is doing it and the United States and Canada are doing it. So it's okay for us to do it, uh, that he won't be able to use that argument. That's the first and most important thing to be able to stop on this. Anyway, uh, I will go on with the rest of the show, but I have to let the puppy in. So uh, I don't know what happened to my little please wait thing, but please wait. Sorry about that delay. Oh, oh puppy, puppy. <laughs> Here. Oh, 
Oh, there we go. So just a reminder, this is Devo. Devo is a puppy. He is only about eight to 10 months old. And uh, Devo is a foster dog. He doesn't have a forever home. And uh, if you would like your own Devo uh, to jump around your computers <laughs> and break things, then you can have him because he is up for adoption and I am just taking care of him for the day. So you can get a hold of me, or I think it's Northern Lights. I don't know, get, get a hold of me, so post in this comment thread, I'll get the details. If you would like your very own uh, 60 pound uh, giant husky or Malamute husky mix of some kind. Um, he is cute and definitely a puppy full of energy and jumping on things. Holy cow. Okay, so I'm sure he's chewing my jacket as we speak. Now, carrying on, uh, so it's important that we have <laughs> the ability to share news and to discuss news and to just become journalists without the permission of the government and without the having the government tell us what to investigate uh, and that if we investigate the wrong thing, that it's fake news and that we can go to jail. The, that This is an important thing to have because it allows us to deal with elections. We are still something of a democracy here in Canada. Uh, Thunder Bay, uh, it, our democratic institutions here are kind of faltering, but we're a small part of Canada. The, the whole of the country uh, is is still de democratic. It, 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 you, we do still vote. Uh, so it is important uh, that when it is the time to vote, that we are informed. And that part of that being informed is having access to a media that is independent of the government and that can tell us what is going on in our country, in our various provinces. Uh, and so, for example, right now in Alberta, the writ has been dropped and there is going to be an election coming up uh, in, I believe, this year. And so there is going to be a choice that people in Alberta are going to be making uh, to whether or not to give uh, another mandate uh, to the Notley NDP government, or to go back to the PC, or I guess United Conservative now party, uh, or, uh, and it's not unthinkable, uh, to flip to one of the other smaller parties. Uh, this is not unthinkable because up until last election, the idea that the NDP would govern Alberta was like the idea that hell one exists and two would freeze over. Like it, it was just, I mean, it may have been slightly more likely than a liberal government in Alberta, but it was still just a ludicrous notion that they would never win. They would have to be another moderate conservative party like the Wild Rose Party, who would probably would have won the last election or at least taken a you know minority government um, had they not crossed the floor at the last minute. Uh, this was something that there was... Um, two conservative governments vying for votes in Alberta. And because of the two splitting the, the votes on the right, and because of the, uh, the, the, the scandals that were racking both conservative parties before the election, the only choice that a lot of voters in Alberta had was really just to vote NDP. And I don't think that's necessarily as true today. There was some house cleaning on the conservative side, uh, but more importantly, it's they they were given a chance to govern, and that chance was kind of like a one-time thing. And uh, so, could they do it again? It's entirely possible. They've done a lot of good work. Uh, the Alberta provincial government has apparently reduced child poverty significantly. Uh, so that will have all kinds of uh, splash over effects on crime, and, um, you know, poverty later in life, etc. Uh, so I, I, I took some notes. I went through the, the kind of a little bit of the, the background here. Uh, quote, uh, let's see. So, so while the NDP ha has done good things uh, and has pushed for renewable energy as an alternative to the fossil fuel industry that has been like the, the core part of the Albertan economy uh, and has done so much to get Alberta off of their oil addiction. Uh, they have still also pushed for the oil industry as well. Now, I understand why they did this. They did this because they do actually represent the the, the voters and the citizens in Alberta. And enough of them 
are in the oil industry that they had to do something. They had to have some kind of representation for the oil industry uh, to, to seem as a credible alternative to the conservatives for Alberta. And so, the, yes, from, you know, someone looking at it from the Alberta point of view to the extent I'm capable of seeing it, that part made sense. But on the flip side, as someone who's intending on, you know, at least trying to survive the rest of this century, uh, or, and someone who's concerned with the people who will be surviving the rest of the century, uh, it is still really not a good thing that they put millions of dollars into propaganda uh, that was then ex you know, shown to can Canadians all over, can or all over Canada, both on TV, on Facebook, uh, probably on radio, although I didn't really hear it, um, and trying to convince Canadians that, oh, hey, you know, we should be building pipelines and buying and allowing Alberta to sell their oil. And that, you know, if it's good for Alberta's oil industry, it's good for the country. And this has actually created a fair amount of division in our country because you have the people who believe this propaganda uh, along with people who are connected with the oil industry uh, who you know, may have a self-interest in uh, promoting oil uh, from Canada, whether or not it's quote unquote ethical oil you know, irrelevant here, um, that regardless of whether that is the case, it's still going to be, uh, the net result is going to be pulling the oil out of the ground or out of the, the tar sands, uh, put, sending it to somewhere where it's going to be burned and used in a internal combustion engine somewhere. And then it's going to go into the atmosphere and then add to the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And that will lead to more and more climate change. And so th the fact that they've put their scarce resources, their, their millions of dollars into this effort is kind of damning from an outsider's point of view. Now, why am I talking, first of all, why am I talking so much about Alberta's election? Uh, I mean, I grew up in Saskatchewan. So regardless of how far away it is now, it is always going to seem like the neighbors next door, the, the, the 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 you know state or, or provincial government that is close enough that their decisions not only affect things like the watershed uh, that is in around or in and around the North Saskatchewan River uh, and South Saskatchewan River it is affecting Saskatchewan's environment uh, but it's also they're they're close enough politically. Uh, that is, it's, it's kind of worth paying attention and dealing with their issues on their own kind of grounds. Uh, there's a really good uh, documentary, now that I'm thinking about this, uh, I've totally forgotten the name of it, uh, that basically talks about the, the history of Saskatchewan and Alberta's political uh, parties. Uh, and they kind of trace to a very, you know, two, two guys uh, who were in kind of the same place at the same time. Very interesting documentary. I, I'll probably link to that later. But so they've spent the millions of dollars on the pipelines. They've created a trade war with British Columbia, which is kind of ridiculous. Uh, they really not done a good service to the, the good name of the NDP in Canada because they've gone into so much debt. Now, some of the debt that they went in was undeniably the fault of the PCs that came before them. The government was going into debt when they were elected, but it's been quite a while now. And yes, they have gotten their spending somewhat under control, but from the you know perspective of the uh, someone who supports the NDP, the, it's nowhere near enough. Like they should have tried harder by now to get that spending under control, uh, to no longer have deficits, to have surplus budgets, to pay off the debt that they've got. Um, and so when they spend millions of dollars on these unnecessarily and harmful things like this propaganda, uh, it is worth pointing out that those millions of dollars come from getting into debt and will eventually have to be paid off at interest. And that is something that Alberta hasn't historically had to do. It, Alberta historically, you know, for everything wrong the PCs have done, they've managed to keep the budget up until recently uh, more or less stable. Oh, I thought you chewing my shoe. No, Happy's not chewing my shoe. Okay, so th there's the fact that they've gotten into debt, the fact that they've become the stewards and, or at least the promoters of the oil industry in Alberta, uh, 
there is some reason to believe there is some corruption going on already. Uh, it didn't take very long. Uh, the rebel, agree or disagree, has uncovered some evidence that this is happening. Now, is it foolproof evidence? You know, is, 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 there, is it possible that there's some explanation other than that the NDP have done some corrupt dealings? Uh, it's, I have not been following close enough. So if you live in Alberta and think that the, the rebel is wrong in terms of uh, the, the oil company that the Albertan government allegedly invested in that is basically non-existent and is just soaking the government for money, you know, I'd love to hear it. But it sure sounds from an outsider's perspective that this independent media, and again, going to the importance of independent media, the rebel is independent of the Alberta government. It is certainly an alternative to the view uh, that, or the viewpoint that you would get if you ascribe to the, you know, things like being pro, uh, you know, government childcare, pro government healthcare, all, all the things on the left that, you know, you, you, you might uh, subscribe to. You, they don't agree with a lot of it. Their, their view is, is very contrary. And it is that much more important that they are allowed to operate, that they're allowed to investigate examples of possible corruption like this and present their uh, examples to the public because they're not going to be you know, cooperating with the government. They're going to, to stand as an adversary to the government and make sure that if the government in Alberta screws up, that they're called to account on it. And so it is unfortunate and way worse than the corruption and probably even the debt that the government is specifically targeting the rebel to extort them, to try to get them either shut down or to make it financially impossible for them to continue to operate using, again, uh, restrictions on what uh, is considered legitimate news. Now, the way that they uh, kind of go about it is slightly different than the way they have done it in Russia. They've um, made it seem as though that the, the rebel is basically a unofficial political uh, party, um, kind of like a pack or something like that. Uh, but at the same time, Alberta really needs the rebel. They need the rebel to criticize the government. They need that, that alternative voice to say when the government does things that are wrong. And, you know, as, as much as we may not like Ezra Levant and the rebel, he does that. He does that very well in Alberta under an NDP government. Maybe he could have done a better job under the conservative government. Sure. But he does a good job on the NDP for that particular purpose. So the fact that the government would target the rebel and to try to bleed them dry really, really is, is, is speaks negatively of not just the, not the NDP, but the NDP Canada wide. The rest of us are going to have to answer for this when we go to the polls in our own provinces, when Alberta's, uh, or when Saskatchewan goes to its next election, people are going to question, oh, hey, you know, in Alberta, the NDP got elected and they went right into debt and they kept going into debt. Won't that happen here in Saskatchewan? And yes, you could say, oh yeah, historically the NDP have been better. You know, we have the, we had Tommy Douglas, we had Jack Layton, we had all these people who, you know, said and tried to keep out of debt, et cetera, et cetera. But the more recent example is the important one, right? So it's really, really not a good thing from the NDP's perspective. Uh, and it would make sense if the Notley government was punished for these, these things from the NDP, if the, the NDP base left and did something else, that would be, that would make at least some sense. Now, the problem is, where do you go? What is the alternative? You can't go conservative. There's still enough people around in the United Conservative Party from the old days that the corruption there is probably not gone. They're still pro Petro state caliphate. Um, they are still, uh, led by uh, a member of the former Harper government. Uh, they're still dealing with Stephen Harper and his company on the back end. And there's, there's been stories about that uh, that have been published. Uh, they are, from all accounts, going to be not any better than the NDP in terms of getting the Alberta government into debt. So that's not an option. Uh, there are the smaller parties. There's the Freedom Conservative Party, another conservative party. <laughs> And I, I, I went through their platform, and their platform actually seemed like it was fairly moderate. 
Uh, again, I haven't heard anything about what they've actually done or actually said outside of this platform. So maybe they're totally batshit. Who knows? Uh, but there was one thing I did notice that was missing in their platform that seemed like a pretty important oversight. And that is, uh, there didn't seem to be any mention of how they would deal with the First Nations people uh, and the First Nations in Alberta, which there are some. And there are enough with probably mineral rights or some, some kind of um, connection to the, the oil uh, sands that it would be at least worth mentioning or talking about or having some public policy worth pointing out. Like the fact that there is none really does suggest that, yes, they're for kind of more of an independent stance, but they're also entirely, it's entirely possible that they'd be for uh, just, you know, cracking down on First Nations uh, in any time. Like, for example, imagine the case where, you know, some First Nations group blockades a pipeline route, wants a bigger cut of the deal or whatever it is that they want. Um, could you imagine the Freedom Conservative Party bringing in force to resolve that situation? I certainly can. Would they? I don't know. It's worth thinking about. Then there's the Alberta Party, which sounds like the SAS Party for Alberta, which is, oh, that's disgusting. But uh, it does seem like compared to the other options, it, it's thinkable. Like they do have the policy on First Nations, unlike the Freedom Conservative Party. They do have... Uh, they're not led by a member of the former Harper government or, or anyone obviously connected to the corrupt PCs that were thrown out during the last election. And like it's, there, there's nothing hugely wrong about their platform that I can see. So on the one hand, you've got the NDP that have tarnished the name of the NDP across the country, uh, split the country or are trying to split the country uh, along the, the, these lines of, you know, do we want to destroy the Earth's ability to sustain human life or not, uh, being on the pro-destroy side. Uh, and then we've got, the, you know, conservatives. It, it, it's, it's such a mess, right? There, there's really no good options here. So I, I'm interested in hearing uh, from you out there, if you've got exposure to the politics in Alberta uh, right now, um, I'm interested in hearing it. Now, a couple of seconds before this broadcast started, there was a post uh, Schnitz made uh, with quote unquote uh, newsinteractives.cbc.ca, which has seat projections for the various parties, which is the United Conservative shooting for 63 to 75, the NDP from 12 to 23, the Alberta party zero to one. Now that's from CBC, so I would take it with a grain of salt, uh, but it's possible. Um, that does seem more along the line of the historical norm for Alberta. Uh, and so it's, it's conceivable that that could be the results. Um, it doesn't have to be that way. The election is still yet to be, the votes haven't been counted. And people probably wouldn't have thought the NDP had as much of a chance as they did last election. So there's that. But at the same time, this should not have been uh, as, as murky of a decision as it, oh. There goes my jacket. <laughs> I think my jacket's turned into a puppy toy. So um, it, it, it's 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 worth you know bringing this up, trying to figure out what what is the best course of action here. Uh, is it worth like maybe not voting NDP outside of strategic uh, places where there there may be some battleground writings out there? Uh, in which case, which are those? Um, maybe three hundred eight or something like that has uh, coverage of that. I haven't checked might be worth checking out, but it's, it's worth digging into anyway. So Alberta an election coming up, interesting stuff. Uh, it's going to decide uh, it, how Alberta's uh, positioned uh, for major issues like climate change and um, this, this kind of fake news stuff that's coming out of Russia. Uh, it's, this is one of the places where the voters in Alberta have a choice of where things are gonna go from here on in. And so, uh, that, that's kind of all I wanted to go through today. Uh, we're going to try to kind of keep on schedule as usual. Uh, there was one more thing I wanted to get to, but I think I will skip it. So as usual, uh, this broadcast is available on Facebook, YouTube, and from me directly, if you want the MP3, uh, give me a shout on, uh, uh, 
and I'd love to hear more about your take on uh, the Alberta election. So hit me up on Ricochet at Ricochet colon M S Z I S N F for Neptune A F for Foxtrot seven V for Victor Q Q P for Penguin H R D for Delta. Uh, and if you have any suggestions of how this could go differently, maybe a little bit better, uh, again, send them to me. Uh, if you have Creative Commons media or music to play, definitely send it to me because I want this to be a place, uh, a weekly uh, chance for people to get their, their stuff out there. So send it to me. And if you like this broadcast, feel free to help support it by subscriber, tar, or subscriber star villages or Bitcoin. The links will be present shortly. And hold on. I gotta start the copy. And if you would like to own it, your very own Devo, also send me a message. So you can have the joy of having your own dog that will chew up your jackets. Uh, and so I will go out on a track uh, that uh, is a little bit longer, but hopefully it comes through okay. Um, this is Jilla Biafra and become the media. Hopefully you enjoy. <laughs>